let's call it pages one and two, the state of Nevada versus Meta Platforms, case 886-110. On behalf of plaintiffs, go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Michael Gann from Kemp Jones on behalf of the state. Also with me, I have Mr. David Slade. And behind me, I have uh, Phil Carlson, Mark Kruger from the Attorney General's office, Don Springmeyer from my office. Uh, and then behind them, we have uh, Raquel Holdrum from the Attorney General's office, Laura Rios from my office, and Sam Feely also from the Attorney General's office. And then on the Zoom, sorry, I can't see that far, so I have to turn around. We've got Katrina Stark from my office, and I believe, <coughs> it looks like uh, Anthony Walsh from the Attorney General's office, Michaela Holweiler, co-counsel, Brian Moore, and Matt Bush, all co-counsel. And then I believe the Kemp Jones <coughs> Square is our new summer law firm in the law. Nope. Just, now I'll just observing on the Zoom. Sure, no worries. Okay, thank you. On behalf of Meta Platforms, please. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Tammy Peterson on behalf of Meta Platforms, Inc. Um, with me is uh, Tim Hester, who's a bit of a in the case, and behind me is uh, Dan Waite and Dan Pulsenberg. Um, I should note on Zoom, he's not appearing today, but uh, David Sneed is uh, on, on Zoom observing. Okay, anybody else in your group has got a lot more boxes, or people are more than welcome to observe. It is a public courtroom, but just want to make sure. Does anybody else wish to make an appearance? We have some people who had filed some briefing, but I'd understood that that was just briefing for purposes of some of the various matters, but does anyone else wish to make an appearance? Anybody here in court? Anybody else? No? Okay. <coughs> uh, remotely? No. Okay. So thank you so much. So, um, Council, we have two things. The quick one we'll do real quickly. Um, first was defendant's motion to associate Emily Hen, H-E-N-N, -N, document 86. Um, Looks like we can grant that as unopposed under EDCR 2.20s, unless there's somebody from the state who's going to have a position. I didn't see anything in the written form. Your Honor, Michael Gain for the state, no objection to that motion. No, no opposition, I should say. Okay. So it's granted EDCR 2.20, the court having fully reviewed Supreme Court Rule 42's application to the instant um, motion to associate. Please provide the court the appropriate order in accordance with EDCR 7.21. <clears throat> to the DC 31 inbox within the 14 days. And please do remember to add the <clears throat> appropriate language with regards to compliance with Nevada rules uh, in said order. Okay, so the next one is, pardon? It's my keyboard person, I was just asking for a document on the judge. Oh, sure, which? The, was that 86, I apologize. Yes, okay. the motion to associate was 86 and there's no other documents since it was not opposed. Okay, no worries. Uh, going to defendants, um, the redacted motion for protective order regarding jurisdictional discovery, document 113, temporarily sealed, document 112, request for the OST, document 115, NEO 117, certificate of service 120, um, opposition 128, temporarily sealed 129, reply 136, temp seal 135. Uh, so. Realistically, we took care of the ceiling, and then we have some, there's two motions to compel because I think with the way you all filed it, it came across a little bit differently on the orders or something. Well, we, should, yeah. we have, a, have a, a note about it being duplicative. Yeah, Your Honor, uh, Michael Game for the state on, it looks like April, 19th, 2024, the state filed its motion to compel related to the jurisdictional discovery the state served on META. And then on, let me get this here, and I don't have document numbers, I apologize, but it looks like three days later on April 22nd, META moved for a protective order, and it's largely redundant of the state's motion, except that it also deals with the um, Rule 30b-6 deposition topics that the state served on uh, META. Okay, so from a practical standpoint, because the posture we have with the two various requests for the court, do you all have an agreement of how you want to do the argument aspect? Because you've got mostly an overlap, but you've got a little bit of difference. And so an interesting, on a motion, and I have an OST, where I'm going with that is, do you all want two per side? Do you want one per side? Are we treating these differently? So it's 
Motion opposition reply, then motion opposition reply. What are you all requesting? Because the court's not going to have a preference, so let me know if there's something that meets you all's needs that you're in agreement with. Uh, Your Honor, Michael Gaines for the state. We haven't conferred exactly on that. I uh, was hoping that the state would go first. We filed our motion to compel first. If Mr. Hester wants the last word, because they also filed one and their reply on their motion for protective order was filed last, I'm not going to make a big issue out of that, but it is uh, redundant. I uh, am planning to address everything at once. Uh, I think that's more efficient for everyone, particularly the court. Yes, Your Honor, Timothy Hester from Meta. Uh, we, are, we are fine uh, handling these issues together, um, but as the court noted, there is a slight difference in that we have a motion for protective order as to the 30B6 deposition. So we would request it at the least the last word if the state goes first. And Your Honor, be, I suppose, I just want to make sure Mr. Hester is not going to object in the middle of my argument, but it might make sense if I address the 30B6 topics in my opening comments as well. I hope that's not an issue. Understood. So, it seems to me that we'll do it the standard motion uh, reply, and then if Med is requesting that they need an additional response because of the procedural posture I deal with at that time, does that work for everybody? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, and for the state, I guess the only comment I would make on, on that order would be uh, we would ask that Mr. Hester's comments uh, to the extent he goes after my rebuttal comments would be limited to the deposition topics, which was the main distinct uh, topic of their motion for protective order. That's going to be the anticipated game plan, but once again, as you know, sometimes things come up during oral argument. The court may have to ask some questions, and may be asking me for a little bit more argument. So let's leave that open for now, but it sounds like everyone's on the same page, at least for initial process, and we need to modify it. We can address that then. Okay, um, so, go ahead, Council. And you know, you feel free to be at podium, at Council table, whatever meets your needs is fine with the court. I do remind you, since part of this does involve some documents that are temporarily sealed, do remember we do have a media request. So if it's not your intention to, to be fully open to the public, then you're going to have to let the court know before you get into something if you're going to make any requests with regards to, say, clearing courtroom or how you're going to address those issues that are currently sealed with in combination with fact, you need to balance the rights of the public or you have a media request. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate you raising that. Uh, I, I'm going to have to admit that I'm not completely up to speed on what exactly was sealed related to this this set of motions. I've only prepared off the under seal version, so I would, I, I'm not looking to create any issues for anybody, and uh, I do want to comply with uh, all the orders sealing and the confidentiality agreement, but I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is I'm going to have to rely on Mr. Hester and, and his co-counsel to help me or raise that issue if I start talking about something that is sealed. Uh, so which version do you have of the pleading in front of you? Do you have the portion that is unredacted or the redacted version? I only have the unredacted under seal papers that I've prepared off of. I have not compared. I have staff in my office and lawyers have done the redactions and filed it that way for obvious reasons, but I just am not familiar with where to draw the line. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, Timothy Hester for Meta. This comes up insofar as there are specific document requests that refer to specific documents that are under seal at this point. I believe that the argument is going to be at a more conceptual level and we're not going to be reading off particular document requests. I think the issue is only going to arise if there is um, reading of particular document requests seeking information on particular documents that are sealed. I wasn't anticipating that that was the way this would be argued, but I think that's really the guidance I could give. Uh, is that insofar as there's a plan to read off particular requests, many of those are the ones that are under seal. Okay, and maybe one way, Your Honor, that we could handle that is if uh, I will do my best to just do what Mr. Hester described and discuss things at a conceptual level. Mm -hmm. And to the extent I feel like uh, the quoted language that has been sealed is 
material, and the court needs to be aware of it. Maybe I will uh, indicate the brief and the page and my number, and the court can follow along or, or read it without me um, saying it. Okay. Well, so what may be of assistance is if you're wanting to read from a specific document request, right, you can state the number of said document request, right? And then everyone can look at their sealed versions of said document request. If you all have seen the various binders on council's table, and how prepared you are on every other matter, um, would it be a correct thought? I don't make assumptions. It would be a correct thought to think that you might have the documents in front of you so that if hypothetically it was referencing request number 12 that you could look at number 12 and just say that's one of the sealed documents and then we could just leave it at 12 and not go into the language of it correct we, we can do that <clears throat> does that meet your needs i like i said it's i need if there's an objection i need to balance right because right now we've got two competing things going on so far it's not been any challenge thus far but you all are going to need to let me know and if there's any objections or anybody thinks I need to visit something more thoroughly then somebody's got to let me know because the general process when I have a sealed document and I have a media request is we do something that allows you to engage in your full argument if somebody thinks that they have to do a portion of an argument that does require to specifically go into sealed materials then we find a way to do that but we need a heads up because it can't be 20 minutes later of guess what you know some things I said and you can appreciate that just because there's probably lots of cliches that are applied to that one yes yes your honor and I guess my twin goals will be to not violate uh, any confidentiality agreement or sealing order and respect Meta's confidential materials at least what's been designated as such and to avoid repeatedly clearing the courtroom <laughs> to discuss those things uh, because it is Friday afternoon the court's time is valuable and uh, I know I have a number of folks from out of town who may want to catch flights tonight so I'm motivated to do my best okay so let's just move forward if somebody thinks there's an issue then just let the court know and we can pause and find out a proactive way to address does that work for everybody yes yes your honor thank okay. you thank you do you want me to address the motions to seal and reject those were not done on ost so many of them are set for 523. usually you all say actually there's an administrative matter we'd like you to address up front <laughs> we would your honor i think we would uh, both sides would like you to um accelerate those hearings advance those hearings none of them are opposed right and that's why the court used the word temporarily sealed when mm -hmm. i said it previously because i wasn't sure if there was going to be an issue that was going to get raised on the seal of the purposes of the hearing since there's not then it looks like i can sorry state i saw you affirmatively nod your head would you like the court to do so yes your honor uh, the state would like the court to advance any motions to seal the state filed and the meta filed and then grant those all as unopposed okay so we've got ones uh that are set for 523 and i'll quickly go through the meta platforms motion to seal and act motion of protective order regarding jurisdictional discovery uh, Court has had an opportunity to review all of these, so I'm going to do it in a more shortened version unless somebody's going to request me to give the full analysis on each and every one. Is anyone requesting each and every one? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. I presume it's on the same grounds as all the prior court's uh, order. Court on looks at them independently to see if each one meets the appropriate standards under Senator Act and Supreme Court Rule 3, applicable case law, and some more recent cases that are in whatever process certain recent cases might be in to in order to evaluate them. Okay. So based on the agreement of the parties, the court had an option to pull immediately before the hearing, since this anticipating might be asking. Um, 523, Meta Platform's motion to seal redact the motion for protective order regarding jurisdictional discovery meets all the standards. It is going to be, I'm going to use the term seal slash redact because some of these are sealing and some of these are redacting just so you all can more efficiently use your time than walking through each and every page. Uh, 523 also plaintiff stated that as motion to seal redact portions of his motion to compel discovery responses regarding personal jurisdiction on issues on order shortening time meets all the standards it is granted both for the sealing portion and the redaction portion going then to plaintiff stated that as motion to redact portions of its reply in support of motion to compel discovery responses regarding personal jurisdiction on order shortening time which was also set for 523 
Um, two, so all of these are being advanced under EDCR 2.23. It is also granted EDCR 2.20, and all of these, of course, also meet the Supreme Court rule. And applicable case laws, that one's also granted. 523, there was also Meta Platforms motion to seal and redact reply in support of the motion for protective order regarding jurisdictional discovery. It also meets all the standards. That's advanced in ECR 2.23, granted in ECR 2.20, and Supreme Court rule for an applicable case law. 528, Meta Platforms motion to seal and redact the opposition to the state's motion to compel. And that also advanced in ECR 2.23, granted in ECR 2.20. And also Supreme Court Rule 3 applicable case law. And for all of the ones that I just named, all six of those, those also were by agreement of the parties, which should be added in. Each party, for regards to your respective motions, please ensure that you file the appropriate orders, granting those in accordance with EDCR 7.21 to the DC 31 inbox within 14 days. Council, would you like to get substantively to the motions before the court today? Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Appreciate the court's time. And Preparation, and I guess I think this is the first time we've been over here since March. Uh, the two days of hearings we had in March, but I missed the hearing and apparently forgotten it. But Your Honor, this is uh, where we landed in March. Was Your Honor ordered personal jurisdiction discovery based on Meta's defense, claiming that. Nevada, particularly Your Honor, did not have jurisdiction over Meta under the applicable long arm analysis and Tricarici, if that's how you pronounce it, that's how I'm going. Tricarci. Tricarci. No there worries. we go. Tricarci. We'll <laughs> be here uh, next week if you want to see them in person. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I'll stop by. Um, but under Tricarci, there was a lot of discussion, and particularly effects test is where uh, the parties and the court uh, had some discussion near the end, and the court permitted the state to serve Meta with written discovery and Rule 30b-6 topics aimed at generating the evidence that Meta said the state lacked to show that this court may exercise jurisdiction over Meta in this case. So that is the applicable uh, scope of what we had in mind as we prepared written discovery requests. And just to, and I know the court knows this, but this particular defense is case dispositive. Meta is asking Your Honor, via its personal jurisdiction defense, to dismiss the case in its entirety and tell the state of Nevada that it may not hold Meta responsible in Nevada for the extensive work within an impact on Nevada's children, family, consumers, and the state that Meta's conduct has had. That is, that is the crux of Meta's argument, its position, uh, and it says the state of Nevada needs to go somewhere else uh, if it would like to file a claim against Meta for the effects of Meta's conduct in the state of Nevada. Uh, that is categorically wrong for the reasons I argued back in March and in our papers. We will be uh, addressing this further in the state's opposition to Meta's motion to dismiss. And uh, incorporating the evidence that we've received to date. But so far, and it's outlined in our moving papers for today's hearing, Meta has produced very few documents, uh, 500 or so pages, most of which are productions of publicly available terms of use and other things like that. So there's very few documents that Meta has actually given to the state. Um, and Your Honor, just tying into Meta's argument that the state hasn't presented sufficient evidence to meet the effects test under Tricarci. I know Your Honor knows the elements, but it's an intentional act directed at Nevada and causing harm that Meta knows is likely to be suffered in Nevada. That's the three-pronged analysis of the effects test described in Tricarci. 
And the state can and will meet that burden, uh, but it needs fair, a fair scope of jurisdictional discovery to do that. Now, after the court ordered Meta to uh, submit to, to personal jurisdiction related discovery, now that Meta has the state's request, it's arguing for a very narrow scope and it's trying to prevent the state from getting the very evidence that it criticized the state for not having. And that's the situation that we're in. I would characterize that as a classic sword shield situation. They're trying to use this defense as a sword, get the entire case uh, dismissed. And then now that your honor ordered discovery on jurisdiction, uh, they're trying to use the same cases to say that it's very narrow. And we don't get, the state does not get uh, many, if any of the documents we're looking for. It's very paltry production so far. Your Honor, uh, Meta's main complaint seems to be the number of uh, requests. And they, they quote back some of Your Honor's comments at the last hearing about discrete written discovery. And we understood that. We certainly heard Your Honor and understood that it, it was to be discreet. But at the same time, Your Honor said a couple of times that you needed to be considering evidence related to the tricarchy effect, legal effects, uh, or effects test and those elements. And uh, you said that a couple of times in your same discussion where you ordered this discovery. Now, <clears throat> Meta is arguing that some of the state's discovery requests that it propounded aren't related to jurisdiction, that they go to the merits. Uh, we completely disagree with that. There is a vast universe of discovery that the state intends and will need to conduct unrelated, if the state gets past the motion to dismiss, obviously, but if this case moves forward, there are broad categories of discovery that the state has not even remotely touched on in what it has served so far that will need to happen. For example, uh, discovery about what Meta was doing to hide its knowledge of these harms from the public. That's something we talked about during the evidentiary hearing. Uh, we'll, we have not served any discovery related to that. We have not served any requests about Meta's decision to develop the challenged design elements in the first place. What motivated them to create these design elements that are detailed in great uh, uh, detail in the complaint? And we serve no discovery about particular design elements, why those design elements exist, uh, what Meta's uh, purposes behind those design elements are, etc. And another broad category that we have not touched down touched on is whether Meta viewed their platform as being addictive or creating any of the harms that the state alleges in the complaints, such as body dysmorphia, particularly in young girls, disrupting sleep patterns, all of those things that I'm sure Your Honor uh, is aware of that we talked about back in March uh, during the evidentiary hearing, none of those things are even remotely touched down in the state's written discovery. Um, all of our discovery that we have served ties into Meta's efforts to grow their market share in Nevada with the Messenger platform. And I know Meta has argued that <clears throat> a number of the state's requests don't involve the Messenger platform, but I will get to that in a bit. They clearly do, based on Meta's own choice, to integrate the Messenger product into its other more popular products in order to drive growth in the Messenger space and on the Messenger platform. So, Your Honor, the state's position is, as outlined in our papers, we any meaningful jurisdictional discovery to be helpful for the court which I believe was the purpose of it in the first place, was for the court to be fully informed about whether it had jurisdiction over Meta in this case. Well, if that's 
the purpose of it, the state needs to be able to conduct discovery on each of the tri carchi elements in the effects inquiry. And I'm just going to read from, from the case. It says, the effects inquiry, quote, focuses on the relationship between the defendant, the forum, and the litigation, and the defendant's suit-related conduct, which must create a substantial connection with the forum. That's what the state's written discovery that has been served does. We are trying to inquire into the effects. And, Your Honor, the effects test that I, that I just described, the inquiry that's described in Tricarchi, has to encompass the harms, the actual effects that are alleged in the complaint. And the state alleges substantial effects from Meta's intentional direction of its business and its conduct to the state, and that those are tied to the actual intent, uh, to the harms. And some of the harms outlined in the complaint that we alleged is that Meta knew that its platform created addiction problems. And that's in paragraph 108 and repeated again in 120, 128, and 129. And that their platforms made teens unhappy, also in those paragraphs. That social comparisons are bad for kids, 136, 138, 139. That kids are driven by the fear of missing out. And that Meta exploited that weakness in teens and kids. That's in paragraph 143. That the more problematic use on all of Meta's platforms actually occurs on Messenger. That's in paragraph 164. And then the particular design elements that are harmful that the state alleges are the filters, the harmful filters, paragraphs 172 to 190, end-to-end -end encryption, which the court has already heard a lot about, paragraphs 204 to 211, the addictive nature of these design elements, 211 to 221, and additional harms are outlined in paragraphs 240 to 266. The point of going through all of that, Your Honor, is if we're going to conduct discovery to set, try to satisfy the effects test, then we have to look at what the state is alleging the effects are. And we, the state, should be entitled to do discovery on those subjects to be able to meet its burden that Meta contends the state has not already met. Now, I would say, and I, I believe it's in our papers, <coughs> excuse me, that the state believes it has already established that this court has jurisdiction over Meta. However, Meta has not conceded. We did ask after we received certain information. We asked Meta if they would withdraw the defense, concede the issue, and we wouldn't have to be here today. And they declined. Uh, and um, you know they they tried to boomerang that back on the state, saying, "Well, then we should just withdraw all of our discovery and stop if we think we have enough." Well, that's that's certainly not reasonable because they're going to contest it. If the court does grant the state's requested injunction, there's an automatic right of appeal. If the court happens to deny the motion to dismiss, there could be a writ petition. So the state needs a fulsome record if Meta is not going to concede this issue. And it has chosen not to concede the issue. So the state has to press forward in the interests of all consumers in the state, particularly the children that the state is looking to protect by way of this lawsuit. It would be uh, irresponsible to not continue to pursue this line of inquiry and make sure that there is a sufficient factual record to support uh, any decision the court makes. Now, <clears throat> Your Honor, I, I think the disputes boil down to a handful of topics, uh, and I'll just go through them very briefly and then come back to them in a little bit more detail. But uh, there's a dispute about whether the state can get discovery related to, uh, at least according to Meta, related to other platforms that Meta operates, like Facebook and Instagram. 
for what it has. Can you focus in because there seemed to be a bit of distinction? They were talking about FF, FVBs, right, and the bumps, right, and then it's also been talked in a more global context when you're saying none. So, can you clarify what you're seeking that they're objecting to relating to the other platforms? Is it that sends people over to Messenger, such to give an example, you know, if you do Facebook a certain thing, it automatically clicks you that you can do a Messenger message. And I don't want to use Happy Birthdays as the example, right? But that you, you know, clicks over for certain purposes. Or are you also talking about promotional type activities that are not in the platform, which is end user? what is promotional for you to get users to clarifying that for the court. That's, the, that's a great question, Your Honor, and uh, Mr. Slade can correct me if I get any of this wrong, but the platform dispute, we, the state is not looking for bumps or notifications or emails from, that uh, are tied to the Facebook or Instagram platform. We're looking for those, it's limited to Messenger related phone. Uh, the platform dispute, though, involves the fact that Meta has chosen to integrate the Messenger platform with the Facebook and Instagram platforms. For example, if you pull up Facebook or Instagram on your phone, the Messenger icon is in the top right corner. And if you click on that and start using it, you are effectively using Messenger. It's been integrated. It was disaggregated years ago and then integrated back into those apps for various reasons that maybe we'll get to someday, but that's not relevant for today. But as it stands right now, the state is just asking for Messenger-related bumps. But the platform situation is uh, the, the evidence that the state cited in its papers that I will not quote has uh, shows that Meta uses, has a messenger team, your Honor heard from Mr. Archibong who's head of messenger, they have uh, teams for Facebook, they have a team for Instagram. Well, because of this integration or for whatever reason and purpose that Meta does it, it leverages team members and employees on the Facebook team and on the Instagram team to help drive growth and usage of the Messenger application that is integrated. So, for example, but is that that's why is that promotional to get people to use Messenger? Is what you're asserting, and so therefore it's tying to Nevada to encourage users. Or are you talking about once the users are already there, through your clicking, which you're talking about having the Messenger squiggly in the upper right hand corner or both? That's if you, that's where the court was trying to get a clarity yes, on where, it was, where you're talking that it's, they're objecting to. It's the former. They are okay. they have larger user bases on Facebook and Instagram than they do on Messenger. And so they want to leverage those larger user user bases uh, where people are already more addicted and are logging into Facebook five times a day, and they want to leverage that activity, or 10 times a day that teens are on Instagram, they want to leverage that activity on the more popular platforms and use it to drive growth on the messaging side, which is in Messenger. That's what they're trying to do. And so they're using Facebook and Instagram employees to help drive that activity. And my understanding of Meta's objection is they don't have to search. In Facebook team members' documents or Instagram team members' documents for discussions about how to leverage those two more popular platforms to grow Messenger even more. And we have cited documents that show Meta is, and it's in our papers, Meta is very interested in growing Messenger. They want to uh, gain market share in the messaging space, and they're competing with Apple, iMessage. And the other ones, we heard about this, and there was some questioning and testimony about it, but the documents show it as well, because you know some of the questioning was like pulling teeth to get information, but we do have documents that show quite clearly what Meta was interested in doing, and that it wanted to leverage its knowledge and experience and user base for Facebook and Instagram to drive more messaging. Uh, and they also have the WhatsApp 
uh, app, which is a messaging app as well. That's not an issue uh, specifically here, but they have these different platforms, and they, they're <coughs> all owned by Meta, Platforms Inc. They, they don't have separate entities. They're all integrated, and they're trying to leverage the knowledge and experience and information and user base of each to drive growth on Messenger. So what the state wants, all we want, is for them to search those uh, employees' records to find discussions about doing exactly what I just said, growing Messenger. <clears throat> there is a goal at Meta to grow Messenger, have more active users than they have right now. That is a clear goal, and they want to use all the resources they have available to them, which includes substantial uh, teams at Facebook and Instagram. So that's all the state is looking for. There's a clear connection. We're not looking for efforts to grow Facebook in Nevada or to grow Instagram in Nevada, except to the extent that the discussion all also says, if we get more Instagram and Facebook users, we'll have more leverage to grow Messenger. Then, then we would want that document. Obviously, it goes to uh, an intent to reach into Nevada or uh, affect Nevada in obvious ways, the ways that we've alleged in our complaint. Now, since we're talking about uh, the platforms, maybe it makes sense to talk about <clears throat> Nevada specific versus non. Uh, the parties have met and conferred, and I believe uh, I understood it from our discussions and letters, but if, if there are documents discussing growing a user base nationwide, and those efforts apply to Nevada, then the state would want those as well. Those relate to Nevada. And uh, also, obviously, anything that's Nevada specific, but if Meta's adopting a growth strategy that applies nationwide to all states, uh, then it obviously applies to Nevada as well, and particularly if they're tracking the data and growth on a state-by-state -state basis, which breaks up Nevada, that's something the state would want. Another category, Your Honor, is uh, what we've defined as youngest users, that's under 13, and uh, for what might be obvious reasons, Meta does not want to allow any discovery about its discussions related to under 13 users because federal law doesn't allow those uh, aged individuals, children, to be on Meta's platforms. They admit it in their papers in a footnote that they're not allowed to even be on there. And they characterize it as these, these uh, people, these children lying about their age to sneak onto their platforms. Well, that's that's not the issue. Uh, the issue is the state wants discovery about Meta discussing these types of users. And when they know that these people are on their, these children are on their platforms, there are documents that Meta describes these as U13. Why would you have an abbreviation for a category of people that, that shouldn't exist on your platform? They're discussing it. Uh, and there are documents cited, at least one cited in our papers, describing uh, and discussing strategies for U13 people, uh, children. So the state wants those. Obviously, Meta does not want to acknowledge that it talks about these people, these children, and growing that user base or how to engage them. Uh, but to the extent such documents exist, the state should certainly get them. There's a whole section of the complaint related to U13 children. In your oral argument, it's a little different than it was stated previously. So was the an objection that falls outside of jurisdictional discovery with regards to U13, or that they do not exist, and so that you're seeking something further that you think does exist, or some option? Well, we know they exist. Uh, Ms. Davis you, you on the- You gave a reference to one. I heard some yeah. testimony on the attempts to do it, but this one didn't appear to be that there was an issue of jurisdiction. <coughs> it was whether or not they really 
exist. Uh, uh, it was kind of unclear as to why I'm hesitating for a brief moment. Sure. I what think. actually was the position that you're asking the court to rule on? Because I can only compel things that exist, right? And we're not asking for anything to be created. Okay. But Meta, uh, as Ms. Davis, at least in, in my view, acknowledged that uh, Meta has ways of identifying these people and that it says once they identify these 13 children, they, those accounts are terminated. But they certainly have information on that. But mostly what we're looking for on U13 is Meta's discussions about those individuals and how to uh, address that category of potential users. There are documents tracking uh, what types of social media apps children under 13 use. There are documents showing that some children start using social media when they're five years old. Uh, and this is being tracked. So, the, and, and they, there's discussion of how to leverage that and get Facebook or Meta's other platforms that are integrated with Messenger to be selected by these children uh, for use to get them conditioned <clears throat> to be using them when they're actually lawfully able to use them. So th that's the type of information the state wants this there's a whole section in the complaint your honor and i can find it real quick uh, on young it's to find youngest users in the complaint and let me see if i've got it and are you doing that under okay great. your jump drive fell <laughs> out of my computer so i've got it It starts on page 99 of the complaint, but it's paragraphs 442 through 458. There's a discussion of Meta allowing youngest users to create and maintain accounts, uh, despite publicly claiming those under 13 are not allowed on those platforms. And there are footnotes citing a number of internal Meta documents. I won't quote them for the reasons we discussed before. But that's alleged in the complaint, so we know there are internal documents discussing this issue, and uh, the state is simply looking for more documents like the ones that are already cited in the complaint, and uh, that's what we're looking for in that category. The, the time component, uh, I'm, I don't really understand Meta's position on objecting to the, the time scope. There is no statute of limitations. For the state's claims that was uh, eliminated in 2021. But in any event, discovery is not automatically limited by the statute of limitations. If we're look, especially on personal jurisdiction, where we're looking to intentional acts aimed at the state that caused the effects, it takes time for acts to be decided to, uh, meta to decide to take the act, for them to actually take, uh, then carry out the decision to take the act, and then for those to have the effects. So even if we're limited, if the state were limited to uh, the effects of claims only going back to a certain date, discovery on the effects test would easily uh, go before uh, the outer bounds of that statute of limitations if one even existed. So, <clears throat> and the state has is, is agreed uh, to alter its requests from 2015 to 2017 instead. We tried to avoid motion practice on this issue, and even under uh, Meta's position, this, we went four years before 2021 when the statute of limit, limitations was, was eliminated for the state on these types of claims. So we, we tried to take a reasonable position, and that was even rejected. Uh, as far as, uh, then there's a standalone on RFP 11 regarding marketing and advertising. They, they refuse to respond to the RFP as written and just refer to RFP 8, uh, which is a different scope. Uh, then Meta has a whole category of RFPs that it just flatly refuses to provide any responsive documents. That's uh, on pages 14 to 17 of our motion to compel. There's about 15 or 
17 or so. Uh, requests that fall into there, and a number of these are the ones that quote various documents, but they're outlined and discussed in detail and why they're relevant and uh, appropriate on pages 15 and 16 of the state's motion. Uh, and I guess to the extent necessary, I can go through those one by one, but I know the court uh, diligently prepares, and so I won't take that time. Um, then the final one is on uh, interrogatory 13. These are the bump notifications that I think we've already discussed. Uh, and I, I don't want to say it's the most relevant of what we're asking for, but it is near the top where Meta has intentionally decided to send bump notifications either by push or email to messenger users trying to uh, re-engage them. And these are directed at users who have not logged in the messenger for a little, whatever period of time Meta decides, and Meta wants to bump them to get them back in the swing and used to, uh, in the habit of using Messenger, and so it sends uh, little notifications automatically. Now, Meta says, well, if those are automatic, nobody's manually sending them. Well, show me a case where that matters. I mean, someone's deciding the protocol for sending these bump notifications. That's the intentional act. It is being sent into Nevada. There are uh, well over a million Messenger users in the state and over uh, tens of thousands of miners who use it. So there, there is a decision to, intentional decision to send these bump notifications to all users. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, this is a little bit like the Ford Motor Company uh, Supreme Court case that is arguing that, well, because we decide to send them to, to everyone and uh, all over the country, then, uh, it's effectively the same as if we sent it to no one. You can't sue us anywhere but our home state. Uh, that's clearly not the law under Ford, uh, where Ford was allowed to be sued in Montana and Minnesota, even though the accidents uh, involved vehicles that were not purchased in those states. They just ultimately ended up there. And we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later, maybe. Uh, possibly it's more related to the motion to dismiss argument. I don't want to get too far into the personal jurisdiction analysis, but uh, one thing I, we did point out in the state's briefing that I wanted to mention is the, the Ford Motor Company decision from the U.S. Supreme Court came out after Tricarchi, after every case that Meta has cited, and it made it clear that the... Uh, there does not need to be a causal link between the intentional acts or purposeful availment and the actual harms alleged in the complaint. And that goes to the, the factual scenario I just described, that the cars weren't bought in those two states, they just ended up in Minnesota, Montana, and the United States Supreme Court said, that's fine, because the, there were sufficient intentional acts and purposeful availment otherwise that made it fair for those lawsuits to proceed in, uh, in Minnesota and Montana. Um, Your Honor, I, I don't want to get into too many details uh, for the ceiling issue so we can move this along, but I would point the court to the first full paragraph of page two of our reply. There's a, a number of facts listed there uh, that we've already discerned. Intentional acts that Meta took that include uh, lobbying efforts in the state, some of which relate directly to uh, the issues in the state's complaint. So I, I believe the state can already meet its obligations to present evidence under the effects test, particularly as uh, clarified by the Ford Motor Company Court. <clears throat> but in any event, we will proceed. I, I don't think I have too many more comments, but I do want to remind the court uh, of a couple of uh, points related to Rule 37, particularly that, that objections need to be stated with specificity. Um, the state challenged many of Meta's 
objections as boilerplate, and that is uh, boilerplate objections are uh, frowned upon and tantamount to no objection at all. Now, uh, I, I looked through Meta's objections that are, you know, copied and pasted into our motion. Uh, they all pretty much say that it's overbroad, unduly burdensome, and not proportional to the needs of the case. And then most or all of them go on to explain why, but the explanation only really relates to the overbroad objection. There's no specificity on the burden or the proportionality. And Your Honor, in, in my experience, and the case law supports this, as cited in our papers, a burden objection needs to be supported with some sort of information. Otherwise, how in the world can the court balance anything against the needs of the case and do a proper proportionality analysis? Uh, I, if I'm look, and I've done this in other cases, when I want to assert a valid burden objection, I list the burden and explain the burden. What is the burden? I've obtained declarations from my client detailing the burden. I'm the assistant controller of such and such company, and it would take me so long to do all of this, and here's why, and I'm a busy person and have other jobs, and I can't sit around for three months and work on written discovery responses. Those sorts of details are helpful to the court. Otherwise, I don't know how Your Honor could do the balancing required under the proportionality uh, test under Rule 26B1, but that's precisely what Meta wants you to do. But these are boilerplate objections with no details related to the burden or the proportionality. The, the state has clearly shown the need for the information. Relevance, <laughs> regarding the overbroad objection, I would just like to, and I know the court knows this, but relevance is extremely broad. It's NRS 48.015. It's you know, evidence having any tendency to make the existence of any fact that is of consequence to the determination of the action more or less probable than it would be without the evidence. So if they're going to say our requests are overbroad because of whatever reasons they've listed, uh, the state contests and rejects all of those reasons. We've clearly shown that our requests are relevant to the effects test that Meta has said we don't, the state doesn't have enough evidence to, to meet its burden. So for them to say we can't meet our burden, and then Your Honor orders jurisdictional discovery, and then they put up the hand and say we don't get any evidence, uh, that is completely unfair, counter to the, what we view as the reason for the jurisdictional discovery in the first place, and it's going to make Your Honor's job more difficult if you don't have sufficient information to be able to conduct the analysis under Tricarchy and effects test or Ford Motor or whatever cases the court ends up applying, there's clearly evidence needed to be put into that analysis. And if the state is hampered in its ability to gather that evidence and obtain it, either by written discovery or the deposition topics, that's going to make it difficult for the state, difficult for, for the court. Um, your Honor, one, one thing I would just like to note for the record, uh, I don't know that it was fleshed out really well in the uh, papers, but I, I believe Meta objected to creating new documents. The state is not asking about creating new documents, but Rule 34 is not limited to documents either. Uh, Meta is one of the largest technology companies in the world. It has a lot of data that it could query. So it doesn't necessarily have uh, documents, but it may have responsive data. Uh, and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that and make sure it's clear that the state's requests, and Rule 34 certainly uh, encompasses data as well as documents. Um, Your Honor, I'm, I'm happy to address anything more specifically, if there's a category. Um, actually, I do have a couple more comments based on Meta's uh, motion for protective order, if, if that's all right, Your Honor. I know it's My challenge, good. I want to make sure everyone has a fair opportunity to be heard. So I really think, time-wise, I need to hear from the other side and even reserve some 
or the reply, and then we'll see if we need some more follow-up. The court does have a question, though. Sure. Okay. Uh, interrogatory number 13. Give you all a chance to go to interrogatory number 13. You've got a parallel RFP, but since I have a log in front of me, that's what I ask about. Now, I'm going to be careful in how I ask my question to the extent that this may fall within some of the sealed, but since this is categories, okay, so my question, and I'm going to have a parallel question for meta platforms when they come up, uh, is, is the intention, what, let's phrase it open ended, what is the intention of 13 and where the court's trying to focus its question is certain of those subcategories, right, are Nevada specific. Is it con intended, right, because you got an A, B, C, right? And you've already discussed the 2015, so that's not an issue for the court, not part of the court's question. But then you have your X, Y, Z, right? So is X, Y, Z con to be contained within subpart A? in Nevada, or are you seeking it throughout the world? That's a good because question. Because I'm seeing the objection seems to imply that you're seeking it out within the world, but yet when I look at the way you subbed it with your ABCs, that's why this court has to ask that question. Well, there's other reasons to it. If you don't mind answering it, that would be great. Yeah, that's a good question. And as I was preparing, I realized maybe our papers did not include our defined terms uh, in our request, and so that might, uh, might have been a problem for uh, the court and staff in preparing. I apologize for that. But um, young users is... Uh, I, I, I know the def... Okay, I'm sorry. I've got the actual ROG, excuse me, interrogatory. I've got the actual interrogatory open, okay, which is in your... I'm actually looking at defendant meta platforms and its responses and objections to plaintiff's state of Nevada's first set of interrogatories, okay, which is your exhibit one file um, your seal and your appendices, okay? So, and then I went back, obviously, I went back to the original documents, right, to see your definitions. But what I didn't see, because their objection, and is there any reason the response is sealed and the court should not read the response? Oh, Your Honor. It is not sealed, Your Honor. Okay. The response is not sealed. So then let me read the response because it's in the context of how they're interpreting the response. And I appreciate litigation versus judges looking at it. Okay. But so, yes, it says what you say. The global objections on meta objects, and since Venetian, the standard sentence shows up all the time, right? Straight out of then Commissioner now, Court of Appeals. Judge Bullis had some lines on making sure you include some of this, but then you have to ask for specific. Okay. Meta objections and interrogatories overbroad and duly burdensome, not proportional to needs of the case because it seeks information that is not limited to the state of Nevada or Nevada users on Messenger, semicolon. And to the extent it is not limited to Messenger, the only platform is issue and plaintiff's operative complaint, period. Meta further objects this interrogatory to the extent it seeks information on the number of, quote, youngest users, as Meta does not allow users under the age of 13 to messenger, point we've already addressed. Meta further objects this interrogatory to the extent it seeks data or information that may not exist in the normal course of business. Well, you can appreciate I have some questions on the Meta side on that response and what parts of it mean. But from your end, it appears that they are interpreting that you're asking for the world, not jurisdictional discovery related to the state of Nevada based on the way that they phrased in reading the plain language of their phrasing of their response to interrogatory 13. So is that the intent that you're asking this court to compel them to provide all emails and push notifications? Because that's not, right? You've already discussed this as much. Uh, including messenger bumps for all of your other social media platforms around the world? I mean, it doesn't say I'm around the world. I'm asking, that's why sure. I'm asking, is it around the world or is that to be narrowed? Fair question. The short answer is only Nevada. And uh, the reason I brought up that we did not provide our defined terms is uh, Nevada consumers is defined as Nevada. Uh, and then young users is a subset of Nevada consumers, and that's what's not clear from what Your Honor was provided. And same with youngest users, that 
the, the B and C part parts are, sub, are subsets of A mm -hmm. only based on age. Uh, it's all in Nevada only. And then when you get to XYZ, so we're only asking for XYZ in Nevada, and it's an interrogatory, so we're asking for numbers in those categories, not all documents. We're not asking them to produce all their, their uh, bumps that they sent, uh, only get counts. And for the platform, Messenger is uh, X is hopefully e uh, an easy one, it's obvious. Right. Messenger Kids, that's their kids platform that we talked about in so March. Yeah, so it's related and it's kind of a gateway platform to get kids conditioned for, you know, when they use the regular Messenger. And then the reason for Z, Your Honor, is the integration that we talked about. Uh, and social media platforms, as you can see, is also defined, and Your Honor doesn't have that definition uh, in front of you probably, but it's primarily aimed at Facebook and Instagram because they are integrated and bumping people to use the integrated platforms is based on the documents cited in our moving papers, it is often a strategy to also get them engaged on Messenger. Because if they open Facebook, there's Messenger. If they open Instagram, there's Messenger. And then you get a zero on this, right? It looks like it's a straight objection. It says, based on these objections, United States that will not provide information in response to this interrogatory. We got nothing. And okay. th this is one, like I said before, if it's not, it's near the top of the list on what at least I believe to be highly relevant on intentional acts. And even if it's uh, automated in the end, it's a decision by someone at Meta to do it in this fashion, and then they set up their machines to do it. So to say that because they, they operate their business, business by algorithms and uh, you know, computer <coughs> code uh, means that it's not an intentional outreach to the state, I think, is uh, a little offensive. But. So the second problem of the court's question is the practicality problem. If it's already understood it's Nevada, and we've got an absolute zero, i.e. see a whole bunch of Nevada cases on providing an absolute zero, I was a little surprised on this one. That's the reason why I asked my first question, because if everybody knew that XYZ only applied to A as further defined by B and C in interrogatory number 13, it's wonderful to see you all, and I appreciate there's other issues, and I appreciate there's the 2015 concept, but this one didn't seem like there would be, it, it, so I guess I was giving you I think I agree with where you're going. Well, no, I'm not making a will. I'm just, okay. I wasn't sure why I would have to ask my first question on, is XYZ defined in ABC if you all didn't even confer on that? We did meet and confer. I believe they, that Meta understands the state's position. We're just asking for these counts, uh, bump counts, uh, in three categories. One is ev everyone, mm -hmm. and the other two are age qualified for these different platforms. Now, you know, I, my recollection of the meet and confer was, well, you know, your complaint doesn't mention Messenger Kids, and so you don't get anything on that. Well, we, we disagree with that. That's we're talking about intentional acts in Nevada, not uh, necessarily exactly what the scope of our claims are. And then uh, all other platforms, that's just the integration thing, which Your Honor has seen the dispute briefed by the parties. Meta doesn't want to provide anything unless it's messenger, messenger, messenger. But, bless you. Bless you. but that's why the part of the reason why the court was asking that question when I saw there was, and this is, I'm giving you a heads up, I'm going to be asking. Meta this question is when Nevada requires, as every litigator should know, and every litigator I hopefully does know, right? And even more so since Venetian has been clarifying the 2019 amendments since March of 2019, right? That even if you object to part, you can't do a full objection if there's a part that needs to be responded to, even if it says simple as maybe you responded to it in a separate RFP, raw, et cetera. So that's why this court needed some clarification on the scope of the meeting confer given the breadth and depth of the experience of counsel I have. 
And since I didn't have that specifically in the, if I looked at the interrogatory in isolation, it's not in there. So I was wondering if that was the dispute that was looking for the world versus yeah. data, which. Your Honor, I, I completely understand. I, these are questions. These are just questions. Well, I, I believe it should be provided. I don't understand the uh, overbroad objection other than uh, Y and Z, maybe, based on the meet and confer. I'm not surprised mm -hmm. to see it on Y and Z. That's Meadow's position. We disagree with it, but that's fine. That's what lawyers do, what parties do. But uh, I, I agree, Your Honor. You, all I can uh, presume is that the numbers are staggering and they don't want the state to have it. Uh, we don't have a specific burden objection saying it would be dif difficult for Meta to uh, gather this information and provide these bump counts in an interrogatory response. We don't have any of that. So uh, that's, uh, I'm not sure what else to say there. The only other comment I wanted to make and then I'll, I'll give up the podium to Mr. Hester is regarding the deposition topics, uh, Meta's motion for protective order really doesn't make any unique arguments about the deposition topics. It's just all overlap with what the appropriate scope of all of this discovery should be. So I don't know that the state has much more to say, but other than that the deposition topics uh, should be permitted on the scope that I've just articulated for the written discovery, that there's no reason to uh, limit the deposition topics separate and apart from what we've just talked about. They haven't said it would be impossible to prepare a witness to talk about these things, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the state asked for the ability to take that deposition after uh, getting a uh, full complement of whatever responsive documents the court orders. If I think. So I can ask you this question now. I can ask you after you hear from Mr. Hester. What I'm going to ask you is, has there been any anticipated time frame of how long a deposition or depositions may take since 30 v 6, as you all know, or it can be multiple people, right? It may not be one person familiar with everything in the list of topics. Well, Unless we should are going to the tippy top and, you know, I know CPA doesn't mean cross examine doctrine, right? Yeah, so um, we're familiar with the Apex Doctrine and would be shocked if they uh, put Mr. Zuckerberg on the hot seat. So, uh, no, I, I don't know. We have talked about it a little bit. I, they haven't identified how many witnesses, if it would be one or more than one. I think there's only reason to have that discussion if it's more than one. If it's one, then it's seven hours. If it's more than one, I don't know. If this day, uh, we'd have to see how the topics broke down. If it's, you know, um, okay. one person has all topics but one, then I don't imagine we would need seven hours for the witness who has just one topic, the state intends to be reasonable and not waste witnesses' time, counsel's time, those sorts of things. So we can meet and confer on those types of issues. We had actually planned to ask them to identify witnesses about a week before the deposition, but a lot of that, you know, is down the road, and um, you know, the timing of it will likely depend on whether the court orders production, uh, supplemental production for Meta, and what the scope of that is, and how long they might need to do that if, if there is such an order. And the intention of the 30B6 definitional topics, same as RFPs and ROGs, i.e. the question I just asked on interrogatory 13 going into those definitional topics, or our 30B6 topics as part of, jumping a little bit to part of the argument, is those 30B6 topics are so overly broad and could take into account outside of what would be the scope of what the court ordered, which I appreciate you all have a little different viewpoint on that. Each side does, which is not unusual. Go ahead. Well, definitionally, Your Honor, the topics would be limited to what we just uh, discussed and what we're asking for on the written discovery. We've only got 10 topics. Uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but we're... Are you going for the world in a... I can cut to the chase. I was trying to do it more. Are you asking for the world that you want verbally that you versus as you articulated what you're asking for in written discovery or you're paralleling it the same? same? Same scope. Uh, we want we want to be able to satisfy the effects test uh, mm -hmm. and gather the evidence we need to show that the state of Nevada, and specifically Your Honor, uh, has the ability under the 14th Amendment and the Due Process Clause and long arm statutes to exercise jurisdiction over META mm -hmm. for this cause of action. That's what we're looking for. Uh, and 
just to put a finer point on it, this was discussed in the meet and confer. We want Nevada specific information. We want uh, information that relates to meta tracking growth nationwide or having a nationwide program that they rolled out, a growth strategy, those sorts of things that would impact Nevada. If it encompasses Nevada, we would like to see it, especially if they're tracking it nationwide on a state-by-state -state basis, user growth and uh, demographics, for example, if, oh, we're trying to grow the, t the uh, 13 to 15 market nationwide, and here's how it's working. We want that information. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks very Good. much. Thank you, Ron. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good to see you again. Timothy Hester see you as well. on behalf of Meta. Just Mr. Guyon right? Is it just me? Or is it the whole eighth judicial district that you think doesn't have jurisdiction? <laughs> the, the whole the whole eighth judicial district, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead, please. <laughs> Because, um, you know, if it was that easy, uh, you know, if there's a chief judge I could find. <laughs> <laughs> well, pro probably first and second judicial districts, too. And, and yes, that's why I asked about the question of Nevada. Is it, yes, oh, sorry, there are. Okay. It's, it's a fair question, and, and we, we believe there's no jurisdiction in the state. In the um, shape of our state. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Let me, let me begin by setting the table just a little bit. Sure. It, at our March 21 uh, hearing before the court, the court directed that the personal jurisdiction discovery would be limited and, quote, very discreet. And the court also said, and that's at, at transcript pages 169 to 70 of the 321-24 hearing. The court also said at page 170 of that same hearing that there would be a discreet time frame. And the court said at 171 of that transcript, it should be less than 30 days and that it should be completed before April 16. And the state's papers highlight three particular points to support its theory of personal jurisdiction under Tricarci. And, and they're stated at the reply, uh, page two, that counsel pointed the court to. And there's three prongs that the state has really been focused on. Users in Nevada, third-party advertisers in Nevada, and lobbying activities by Meta in Nevada. Those are three prongs that the state has called out in its reply as particularly germane on this question of personal jurisdiction. Now, in our view, the case law is clear that these are, in fact, not proper bases for establishing personal jurisdiction here. But to seek compromise and to comply with the court's directive that we move ahead promptly with jurisdictional discovery, we provided the state with discovery on these points that the state has identified in their view as supporting personal jurisdiction, even though we think as a matter of law, they don't. But we provided that jurisdictional discovery and on other subjects as well, we provided discovery. We believe we've gone well beyond what's relevant to the question before the court, which is only whether there is personal jurisdiction in this matter. And we've summarized in our opposition paper at pages six and seven, and in our protective order motion at pages seven to nine, the categories of discovery that we have provided. And I think it's very important to focus on what we have done in compliance with the court's directive. We've provided information on the number of mess messenger users estimated to reside in Nevada. We've provided information on the advertising revenue from Nevada businesses. We've provided information on the advertising revenue from ads targeted to users that are estimated to reside in Nevada. We've provided information on all of the Nevada-based advertisers who have placed ads on Messenger. We've provided information on Meta's lobbying activities in Nevada. We've provided Meta's certificates to operate in Nevada. We've provided information as well on Meta's educational partnerships <coughs> with Nevada schools and on Meta's use of location data, data on Messenger. 
Importantly, we've also confirmed two really critical propositions. First, Can I stop you for one quick yes, Your Honor. Let's be clear, particularly when I was reading. I appreciate the little bullet points. Very nice, highlighted well. Page eight, the messenger location data. So did you actually provide the underlying numbers or the process by which Meta does location data or both or some third option? We provided information on the process by which Meta identifies and develops location data, and we also provided information on the messenger users who are estimated to reside in Nevada. It's not a precise science to know where the users reside, but we provided that information. So the state has the counts of the users that Meta estimates. That use Messenger? Use Messenger in Nevada. So that's been provided, and the information has also been provided on all of the companies that are based in Nevada that advertise on Messenger, and all of the information on ads that, that Meta understands were targeted to users that Meta believes or estimates reside in Nevada. In other words, so in, how are you using Nevada? Are you doing it by IP address, or are you doing it with whatever location services are? Are you doing it by some, and I'm being careful, I'm not going to ask you about any proprietary method, that's why I'm asking you generalized, and obviously the two examples I gave are generalized aspects that aren't subject to anything, and the answer is you know, top secret secret sauce, okay, in a digital format, perfectly fine, but trying to get a better understanding of how you're defining Nevada, right? Thank well, you. The court may, may recall that there was testimony on this from Mr. Archibald. That's why and, I'm asking the question to yes. follow up on his testimony. And, and that it is a complex question as to where somebody resides and that it's not a simple proposition to know with certainty, but there are estimation techniques that involve a number of different techniques that Meta and other social media services use in order to give their best estimate as to where somebody lives. But it is not precise. But we gave the state our best information on where we believe the, the um, um, where um, the counts, I should say, the counts of users that we believe are based in Nevada, and all of the information around advertising to users we who estimate are based in Nevada. So that that's quite a bit of information that goes right to the heart of the prongs that the state itself has identified. I also wanted to emphasize that we importantly confirmed the lack of information on two key points the state asks us about. First, there are no board or investor presentations at Meta regarding Nevada. We confirmed we didn't have any. We also so that include a nationwide campaign that Nevada is one of the 50 states? No, it would not, Your Honor. It would be something that was targeted at Nevada, which I think is really the heart of the Tricarci test, and I want to talk about that a little bit later. Um, we also confirmed that there were no marketing, advertising, or other efforts that were targeted at Nevada to promote Messenger. Again, going to the court's question, certainly there may be nationwide campaigns, but nothing that we identified that targeted Nevada specifically as compared to nationwide activity. And I'm going to circle back to this question of nationwide activity that may touch Nevada in the same way it touches every other state. And I will come back to that point. In addition to the discovery we've provided to the state, the state also has roughly 70,000 documents from its own pre-suit investigation. There was a civil investigation that preceded this litigation. So the state was not starting from scratch by any means. Uh, and had a lot of documents from Meta already. So let's put all this together. In our view, the state has more than sufficient discovery under the state's own theory of what it needs for personal jurisdiction. It's gotten a lot of discovery from us. I'm sorry, can you define what you were saying is the state's theory? 
The states, I would put the state's theory into three categories, Your Honor, and I think it's stated at that paragraph in the reply. Users in Nevada, third-party advertisers on Meta in Nevada or on Messenger in Nevada, and lobbying activities in Nevada. Those are the three categories. And users is what age groups are you clarifying for users? It, it would be all it would be all ages of users, Your Honor. Okay. And are you saying that Meta has produced information on all ages of users? The reason why I'm saying that is going back to my specific question right on 13. It's rare these days to see an inexorable zero or we're not responding. Yes, Your Honor. I'm not sure who prepared those. I know who signed them, but I'm not sure who actually prepared those. But as you did with other of the interrogatories, at least some of the other ones had a reference to other responses. Not saying whether it's sufficient or not, I'm not there yet. But 13 was challenging with it being such a part of, in the words of the state, right? Are you reading it? It has a kind of more global reaching aspect than some of the more pinpointed ones. And it was a, we're not going to answer. Your Honor, I think- I'm not sure number 13 really picked specifically as being the very last one for you all to kind of raise, you know what I mean? But it does kind of stand out. So that's why I'm asking these questions, right? Because I'm hearing what you're saying, read all the briefing, and then I see a, we're not going to respond. And I appreciate that was kind of limited to us, but- Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. And, and, and I, I, I can go to that point right no, now. No, I'll let you finish your presentation. I'm just, was explaining, sometimes people like to hear the reason why a court's asking questions. I yes. I really love, I'm perfectly fine telling people the exact roadmap of where I'm going. Right. Or asking the questions, go ahead, please. And I would say, Your Honor, at, at, at its heart, this question of bump notifications is going to be subsumed within what we've already given to the state. By definition, they have, a user, they have the user counts. And when they're talking about bump notifications, those are bump notifications that would be going to users. So they have the information that they really need, which is how many users are estimated to be in the state. If that's what they think is relevant, we don't think ultimately that supports personal jurisdiction, but that's not for today. Which is why the court has to go back to the question of how you're defining users, right? Because if they have, at least from the state's argument, right, is there's different types of bumps, right? There's a, your current messenger person, we want to have you doing it every day, every minute, right? Because um, that's the nature of every business, right? You want people to be doing your product, whatever it is. Um, two, there's bumps for people who may not have been on messenger. The, you know, we'd like to have you come back, you know? You're paralleling it, you know, you had something in your shopping, electronic shopping cart, and you know, you didn't buy it. Are you sure you really didn't want that deal? Come back to us, right? Um, but maybe more tangential. You haven't used Messenger in a while, come back to us. And then I'm also hearing that there's the bumps on other platforms. So when you're defining the user count that you give, and you said that that would subsume the bumps, is that the all users current and cast in Nevada for a particular time frame on Messenger? Or is that current users from a particular slice or snapshot in time? And is it just Messenger? And is it just 18 and above? You know, I, I'm trying to, right. you all are doing a wonderfully legal job of how you're describing users, but I need to it clarify just what each side means. Go ahead, please. Well, Your Honor, we certainly didn't exclude um, users uh, between 18 and 13, it would be users in all all users of Messenger, and it would be over time by year. The information has been provided on the total counts. So when we go to this question of bump notifications, I would submit ultimately it's not relevant. There's another reason why it shouldn't be produced, but it's not relevant when you know the number of users. That's the critical number from the state's own perspective. We don't think that helps them established personal jurisdiction, but so be it. That's not the issue before the court today. I appreciate the extra education until you're throwing in. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. okay. And um, so I think the critical point is under the state's own theory, they've gotten this information. And the state, and even today, Your Honor, I, want to, I think this is really a crucial point. The state never says, even today, why the discovery that's already been provided 
is not enough to address the personal jurisdiction issue. Their, their argument today is we want more, but they never explain to the court what are the gaps in what's already been provided. What are the problems with what they have? They're talking about more and more and more, but I go back to where the court began, which is setting a discrete time frame, getting this done promptly, having it be discrete and limited, and you did not hear, even today, an argument from the state, why is it that the information they have is insufficient? And I want to direct the court, in particular, to an exhibit that the state has attached to its reply brief. And it's reply exhibit one. And there the state says, writing to Meta, and I'm quoting from reply exhibit one, based on the material that has been produced in this case, the state has overwhelming evidence establishing each element for personal jurisdiction, quote, beyond any reasonable dispute. Then they go on to say, in reply exhibit one, we received and reviewed Meta's productions, and it has become clear to the state that there is simply no factual basis for Meta to continue to dispute personal jurisdiction. So here the state is saying to us in mid-April, we've reviewed your productions. We think it's absolutely clear that it establishes personal jurisdiction. Now, we don't think the state is right on either the facts or the law, but that's the position they took with us, that they have enough already to, dem to establish personal jurisdiction. And I submit that that position exactly demonstrates why there's no need for further jurisdictional discovery at this point. The state takes the position, it has the information that we've provided, and takes the position that this establishes conclusively, in their view, that there's personal jurisdiction here. We do not think they're right, but that's for another day. The question today is, do they need to get more discovery? And I put that together. Do they need to, is the question before the court, or are they entitled to, under Nevada rules, to responses to what they said in accordance with the court's direction of ordering jurisdictional discovery based on the plethora of appellate precedent? I would say, Your Honor, the key point is that the concept was there would be a limited and discreet period of jurisdictional discovery, that this would not go on. And I want to go to that point a bit. Just, I mean, if you all want to know, you know the crystal ball that I mentioned before. The court's, you know, discreet means distinct, right? In a mathematical equation, it's a discreet variable, whether it's the numerator, the denominator, et cetera. Chemicals, right? They have discreet chemical reactions. Discreet, as the court utilized the word, was to intend the distinction as set forth in the plethora of case law, you know, or published and unpublished, that sets forth that in order to determine personal jurisdiction, you don't go into all of the merits discovery. You do it discreetly on personal jurisdiction. This court was in no way limiting the way that appellate courts have defined what jurisdictional discovery can and cannot be. And as far as the time periods, yes, any limitation on time that is shorter than your general discovery period would be a discreet, right, separate period of time. So, you know, everyone's clear. I was, you know, not slicing this pie to give a sliver. I was giving the appropriate slice of the pie that is allowed in jurisdictional discovery based on the Nevada case law. So, that's equally unique. I know what I meant. Go ahead. I understand, Your Honor, but it does, I think it bears on this question of how much is needed when the concept was we were going to get this done in 30 days. And that's where I want to turn a bit to the state's request. So far, I've been talking about the discovery Meta has provided. But in terms of the state's discovery request, and in particular the pieces that they are now saying they need in addition, those requests are far broader than something that could be done in 30 days. 
There's 37 RFPs seeking all documents back to 2015. National activity document all documents relating to a number of different subjects across the nation, not confined to Nevada. 13 interrogatories, likewise, not confined to Nevada. 10 topics for the 30B6 deposition that we'll talk about. And it's just not plausible that that scope of discovery could be completed in any kind of reasonable time frame. And the concept was we would go ahead in a reasonable time frame and get things done. And that's why I began by emphasizing that we made compromises. We didn't think some of this discovery was relevant, but we made compromises to address what we thought the state needed under its theories in order to answer the question before the court. So let's talk about two core ways that the state's requests are overbroad and excessive in terms of this question of jurisdictional discovery. The first is that the requests are not limited to messenger. And as the court knows, and I think the court alluded to this, there are three separate complaints that the state has filed, one on messenger, one on Facebook, and one on Instagram. And the state in its complaint at paragraph 38 alleges that Meta is a standalone app, and it is, and alleges that Messenger separates the messaging functionality from the main Facebook platform. Very the record, you said Meta is a separate app. I think you meant Messenger. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Right. Yes, no Messenger is a separate app. No worries. That's what I thought and, you were doing, please. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. And so what you have here is a complaint that is solely focused on Messenger. It does not have allegations related to Facebook, does not have allegations related to Instagram. And the basis for the jurisdictional discovery, therefore, has to focus on Messenger. And it should not get into all of this discovery related to Meta's other services. And I think that comes, the, the, the litmus test comes from Tricarici, where the court said the defendant's, quote, suit-related conduct must create a substantial connection with the forum. And that's 440 P. 3rd at 650. So the point, and I wanted to highlight that, suit-related conduct, since the suit is focused on Messenger, likewise, the question of jurisdictional discovery and the question of jurisdiction is going to be determined by Messenger. And this has been one of the key propositions where the parties have been at loggerheads, Your Honor, because the state is seeking discovery on all of Meta's services. And indeed, in the interrogatory 13 that the court, court pointed to, it included a request for information on all of Meta's services. It was not confined to Messenger. So that's one key proposition, and it's one of the core reasons that the discovery, in our view, is too broad that the state is seeking. It should be confined to Messenger. Second proposition, Your Honor, the state is seeking discovery on Meta's nationwide activities. And let's, let's talk, talk about this question of under 13 users that the court has focused on. And we can turn back to interrogatory 13. As written, that is not confined to Nevada. But more importantly, it's seeking information on an activity, namely bump notifications, that is carried out nationwide. And I want to really generalize this point to a number of the different requests that the state is asking about. Information on targeting teenagers. Information on expanding the user base, either of Messenger or other services. Notifications. Time spent by users. All of these are nationwide, in fact global. Um, and so insofar as the state is seeking that discovery, it's ultimately not relevant 
to the question of jurisdiction before the court because none of this activity is targeted at Nevada. Okay, and can I stop for a second? Yes, and this is just where I saw a very difference in your positions on this kind of national global context. Is it your contention on behalf of your client that it must only be directed at Nevada in order to be utilized? It can't be something that has a broader scope but also includes Nevada, i.e. many people in this courtroom might mention a particular case that maybe was in this courtroom for a long time of opioids. Um, that, right, world, I, I'm trying to take something so just completely in a different area that, you know what I mean, and something that done, um, you know, other than subject to a bankruptcy for some small little aspects that may or may not come before me so I can actually say something on this, right? But, so that's why I'm trying to get, is it your client's position that anything, if it is done globally or nationally, right, and impacts Nevada, does not, cannot be used for a partial effects test, that it can only utilize things specifically directed to Nevada? And I'm very appreciative. Remember, Tri I keep citing Tricarchi. You know, Tricarchi is a tax case, right? Everybody knows that it's a payment of tax cases involving um, cellular, selling a cellular company. And I can't say anything else because it literally is coming before me next week, a different version than the one you all are citing. But, you know, same people, at least one of the same people, Tricarchi. So, that being said, but then opioids is a very different concept, right? And there's lots of examples this court could use. I was just trying to use one that I knew. The large majority of the attorneys sitting in this court will might be familiar with. So that's why I'm, tr I'm trying to get an understanding. You're saying if it impacts Nevada, but it impacts other states as well, but it cannot be used as an effects test. It must only be, it can't be the towing and the foot dipped in Nevada. It has to, you know, whatever analogy you want to use. You know, it has to be the whole thing, Nevada or nothing. Well...